insane that someone came with this idea that like, let's get some foxes and put them in the cages and maybe let's have 50,000 of them. Let's keep them at one farm. It's gonna be so good idea. This is insane. When you get over the fence, it's like a statement that you will not hide this cruelty from the public anymore. Because us who is watching you, and it's us who is watching what you're doing behind these fences. People think that fair industry is something that happens in China or maybe Russia, but for sure not in Poland or not in Europe. I feel like we're doing just public service, exposing what the public wants to be exposed. When we started, I didn't know that much about the industry itself. But very quickly I learned that the list of reasons the stop, it's just endless. I think some people just cannot stop looking when they see some injustice. Once you really see how it looks, it's hard to forget about this and just live your life without trying to do your best to stop it. Me and a couple of friends started to think about starting our own organization called later on Otwart Klatki. We knew that we have to change something in Poland. And we knew that investigations is one of the most powerful tools for people like us. What we started here is not going to be solved very early, very quickly. I believe that we have to prepare for a marathon. You are now filming one of the biggest farm in Poland. There is uh, 180,000 minks. Before we started the investigation, there were very few photos and videos of Polish fair farming, and mostly it was official photos of the fair farmers themselves. Before we went into fur farms in Poland, we saw the pictures from other fur farms from other countries. So we knew what to expect, but it was a huge surprise for the society in Poland. I didn't know it exists. I certainly didn't think it was farming. That's, that was the central source of fur. We learned that it's a big thing in Poland, and they told us that there are also fur farms in Lithuania. The Lithuanian public was completely unaware, and what we saw really shocked us. 
fur trade was banned in the UK because it was deemed morally unacceptable and at odds with the British public's opinion of how animals should be treated. And actually, the fur trade has made an insidious comeback into the UK market. So since the ban took effect in 2003 in the UK, we have seen the domestic trade replaced by imports of fur from overseas. It happens behind closed doors, uh, thousands of miles away, it's off limits to the public. It's of critical importance to investigate these farms and consumers have a right to know. They don't want us to film because we show the truth, because animals suffer. I mean, what would they say if they knew we were here? Fuck off. Right after getting inside of the first farm, I just basically came to the first cage that was the closest to the fence. I was very calm at the moment. It was a really strange feeling because I had no idea what to expect. I was so focused on the technique of attacking the footage. But the next day, it all came to me. For me, this, this was this moment when, when I almost like broke down completely and I almost started crying. Um, and I think I, had, I needed a few minutes to collect myself and uh, remember about the work we are here to do. Very often we were surprised, even if we thought that we already knew everything. With every new farm, there was something new to be learned and new things to see. The smell of it, you can't believe that it, it can be so bad as it is. These animals are either very apathetic or very aggressive. They kill each other, they chew their own paws. Mothers are able to kill their own babies inside because of the levels of stress. Cannibalism, rotting bodies in the cages, injured and sick animals in the cages, foxes and minks running in circles, going insane. But also things like skinned bodies of the foxes just uh, hanging in the front of someone's house. I've seen farms where all of the animals that were there obviously had mental problems. No. That's why it's a big surprise if you know that there are vets that apparently go to fur farms and tend to not notice anything. I was already an activist. I read a lot of books. I've seen a lot of pictures, but I really didn't know how I'm going to react. It's, it's not an abstract thing anymore. When you look at the fox that has never seen life outside of the cage. And you know that this fox has been doomed from, from the moment of birth. It, 
it's an extremely powerful feeling. After collecting all the footage and pictures from the fur farms, we decided to make a document that shows the situation of fur farming in Poland. Sometimes we were even using handbooks for fox and mink farmers. Some behavioral and health problems are known to the farmers and they even learn about them at school. There were people that were genuinely surprised that foxes and minks spent all their lives inside of the cage. The first investigation was a big breakthrough, but we didn't realize at that moment that we would be so much attacked personally by the fur industry. Yeah, here's the farm behind the house there. You see there's cameras there. Sometimes you can just find a fur farm by the smell of it, even from the distance of two or three kilometers. Uh, so very often, you know, these farms are like somewhere in the back of the town. After the farm. The word farming may show to you an image of some old building in the countryside, but in the last 10 years we've witnessed a huge explosion of industrial fur farms for 50,000 100,000, 200,000 animals. We've become the third biggest producer of fur in the whole world behind Denmark and China, killing almost 10 million foxes, minks and raccoon dogs every year. And that's just Poland. This is the thing about the fur industry. Very often they are hidden from the public eye. All you can see is the wall, barbed wire, the fence and Many people don't realize what's actually happening almost in our backyards. Uh, farmers don't like what we are doing, and that's why they are really trying to attack us on every possible front. <laughs> Two people that were working for the fur farmers infiltrated open cages, and they were filming our meetings for over three months. All the time there are some new Facebook profiles, some strange websites making fun of us personally. I know that I was being followed by some journalists working for the fur farmers. The reality is that we don't have anything to hide. And everything to do is something I'm very happy to, to share with the fur industry and the public. What they are scared about are the people. They are really afraid that when the society sees the true face of the fur industry, it's going to vote in favor of the ban. Trzęs się był wymieniały, wychudzony z chorobą skóry. Był wychudzony, miał chorobę świerzb. Ferdynand bardzo się bał. Dostaliśmy zgłoszenie dotyczące złych warunków na jednej z ferm w Wielkopolsce. I od razu podczas tego obchodu okazało się, że jest jedno zwierzę, które jest w bardzo złym stanie. 
Problemem był sam właściciel, który na początku był do nas bardzo negatywnie nastawiony. The fur farmers are thinking about the profit so much, they would keep obviously suffering and disabled animals inside of the cages so that they can kill them in few months and take the fur. The law allows animal protection organization to confiscate the animal if it's dangerous for the animal to stay in that place. Dla mnie było bardzo straszne widzieć to. To jednoznacznie pokazywało, jaki jest stosunek hodowców, właścicieli do tych zwierząt. One są po prostu przyszłym futrem. One of the first things that changes for the animals when they are rescued is that they get finally real names. It's an act of treating them as the subjects and not objects and thinking about them as sentient beings that deserve uh, happy lives and deserve to be treated respectfully. I think it's got nothing to do with uh, being an animal lover. If you're a human rights activist, it's not like you love each and every single human person in the world. You just think that they kind of deserve to be treated okay. Ferdinand represents almost 10 million fur animals being killed each year in Poland only. So they're a perfect reminder why it is so important to keep on fighting and why it is so important not to give up. When there was a ban in UK, there were just a couple of fair farms left. Right now in Poland, we have this huge political lobby as well. Very big business, very big money. Raimund Konsiorek is one of the most known Polish mink farmers, probably between one and two million animals who at the moment was vice president of the Fair Breeders Association. Now he's the, the president of it. Everything is just on the film, the freight industry just couldn't pretend that it didn't happen. Fur farmers are also trying to sell this story of us picking the bad apples and showing only the worst case scenarios. It was very important for us to document the farms that belong to the biggest and most professional fur farmers. They should really have very high standards. What we have seen there is just exactly the same. Our case is not that his farm is extremely bad or anything like that. We just say that it's the same as any farm. So we went to some farms. It's just these depressing sheds and rows and rows of them and thousands of animals. What they have is a very nasty, stinky food that's dropped on the top of their cage. Some mink get food dripped on their ears and tops of their head, so their brothers and sisters just bite these off, chew that food off together with their skin. You know, many minks don't have ears in fur farms, so if you wonder why, it's probably because there was food on them. Just tear each other to pieces. The mink have webbing on their paws because they are swimming animals. Can you imagine standing on wire cage floor 
with webbing between your fingers. They live in, in caves. <laughs> they dig caves, they swim. So the natural thing for the mink to have would be water to swim in, or at least, you know, to wallow in <laughs> for a bit. They don't have that in fur farms, naturally. That wouldn't pay off for the farmers. These solitary animals, suddenly they are in tiny cages, brushing sides with each other for the best part of the year. And then they are killed, you know, never having really felt that liberty. Of course, it brought media attention to the topic. I think nothing unusual for mink farming, but of course, still shocking for the public. After a couple of months, he sued us for defamation. He claims the footage doesn't come from his farm. He says it's from China. Apparently, it's easier for us to travel to China than to go inside of the farms here in Poland. For the fair farmers, it's about survival, to stay being able to make this big money they make. This industry has huge amounts of money, so some Polish journalists even documented that senators received money, like directly from fur farmers. <laughs> Trying to sue someone because they have shown some pictures is limiting the freedom of the society to know what's going on in the country. It tells me they will use any weapon, any lie, any possible attacks just to survive. They will not to each other today. Yeah, I'm just laughing, but we don't, we're not used to the front gate. <laughs> the important thing about the footage from investigation is that we used recorded GPS coordinate. And today we're gonna use the same GPS device at the same farm to prove that the coordinate show exactly the place when the footage was recorded three years ago. The truth is on our side. I suppose they prepared the mink farm for the visitation, so it's going to be the cleanest uh, mink farm ever. They know that we want to close this place, and this is strange for them, why we fight with them. Some of these people can still find something better in them, but they are so deeply in this culture of treating animals as objects, they are not able to see these animals out of the cages. They can't escape it. There's thousands of those cages, thousands of animals, so you can't really see how many injured animals there are. And they have only so many working hours, right? So even if they were like the most diligent vet in the world, they couldn't figure out all the animal welfare problems in the working hours that they have physically, even if they really wanted to. And then there's the problem that they very often don't want to. Spent three hours explaining how the GPS device works. I don't know if the mink farmer is arrogant and lying, or he really thinks it's not from his farm. Well, you get desensitized to animal suffering to a level even as an animal rights activist. So I suppose they just, you know, they, they just see even more of that. So apparently it doesn't register as non-normal anymore. I think he really believes that his farm is like secured and guarded 24-7. Maybe he just doesn't believe in our skills. That's pretty sad. Sometimes when I go through the old photos, the old films, I remember many of the animals. We rescued Hansen and Gretel, and with them 
is kind of special for me because I remember them from where they were like uh, four weeks old. The image that you can see in the sanctuaries, yeah, it's heartbreaking, I think. You also remember with all those animals that are still on the farms. The foxes that get rescued is such a tiny fraction part of the whole industry of foxes that it's just, if you, if you saved one child from a drowning boat, it would be very important, but also you couldn't help but think how many drowned, right? For the foxes, uh, farmers use electrocution. Of course, there's no anesthesia, electric probes into the anus, into the mouth of a fox or a raccoon dog, and after three seconds, the heart should stop. Minks are gas in a special vehicle because you need a device for like massive killing, for, for example, 100,000 minks, and electrocution would be too slow for that. They would never leave their cages the six months life they have. Sometimes people focus on injuries. Injuries are something that farmers can probably prevent, or at least they can heal them. But the mental suffering is immense. It's only natural that they develop what's called stereotypies. You can see animals just repeating the same pointless action in, in mental distress and the psychological suffering is very touching and very disturbing because then you realize how much capacity it has for suffering and how much like a human it is. Denmark, Holland, United States, China, Poland, they all use the same cages. They all use the same systems. You can't do anything to improve these farms. Making these cages even twice bigger is almost no difference for these animals. There is no way to take a wild animal put it inside of the cage for all their life and expect that nothing bad will happen to this animal in this psychological way. The existence of the cage, not the size of the cage, is the problem. I think we can cooperate with the politicians, fashion industry, but with the owners of the fur farms. And fortunately, there is no room for compromise. The fur industry is generations old, you know, it is probably one of the oldest trades ever. So there's a massive heritage and I'm not prepared to see that heritage just disappear now. The fur is natural, you know, it is a, an amazing, uh, beautiful uh, fabric. It's hard to break down why there's been an increase uh, in the UK. Some of it is the domestic market, and particularly younger people buying fur. Maybe a girl in their 20s who's buying just a fur pom-pom. But then you've also got the very big high-end department stores who are attracting overseas buyers from the Middle East, from Russia and from China. One of the things which has happened in the fur trade is that there's now a lot more products available from smaller, more affordable items right through to the, the, you know, the very expensive Fendi high-end luxury items. The most recent value is around 30 billion. If we carry on as we are, then I see for having a very, very strong, healthy future. <laughs>